Ministry shuts down federal government colleges amidst threats. And Sarah sues INEC over vote buying in Egg Kitty. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anacom. The Federal Ministry of Education has directed the closure of all federal government colleges in Abuja following security threats on the Unity Colleges located in the FCT. It would be recalled that some of the federal government colleges had been asked to vacate the school premises on July the 20th, 20th I beg your pardon, while others were closed on the 26th of July. Now, the Director of Press Federal Ministry of Education, Mr. Ben Gong, said the decision was as a result of rising insecurity and threats to lives and well-being of the students. Discussing this with us is Dixon Osage. He is a criminologist and global security analyst. It's so good to have you join us in the studio, Dixon. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, I wish that we would, you know, have conversations like this on a better note, but unfortunately, um, this is what we're talking about today. Okay. So... It started, it's, it's, there's been a string of attacks, the Kujay prison, okay. an attack of the president's advanced team. Okay. Of course, we still had the lingering issue of um, the passengers on the train that are still in captivity. in captivity. And then, of course, the turbaning of a so-called bandit by an emir. And then threats to Mr. President, threats to uh, the governor of Kaduna State, and here we are. Uh, the FCT is saying that schools need to be shut down. Now, a lot of people are wondering why we're not getting the kind of reaction that we would, we would expect from a government that seems to be fighting terrorism or that their mantra would be they wanted to put an end to terrorism. So, I mean, you're a security person. I'm guessing that you might have an answer for us. What type of answer do you want? <laughs> I'm just wondering. <laughs> All right, you see, uh, you just uh, gave... Uh a brief analysis of what we're going through in Nigeria. Too much of security issues, which are always classified as multi-dimensional security threats coming from various angles of the Federation. And uh, that tells you and I that uh, the government is not uh, prepared to solve the situation or perhaps they are incapacitated. Uh, because I see no reason where a country of over 200 million people uh, we will have a lot of military generals. I can tell you we have a lot of military generals. We have a lot of police uh, officers. We have uh, the DSS. We have the uh, Navy, Army, Air Force. We have a lot of security agents. I, I, as of the last count, we have about 25 security uh, agents of various uh, departments and various uh, formations to foster uh, the spirit of insecurity in Nigeria. And I could tell you for free, uh, that uh, the federal government has spent a lot of billions in this uh, in these security issues, trillions of naira, I mean to say, and uh, you see people on the bikes, you know, going after our military, going after our people, and just succeeding. Uh, to be very honest, I think the government has failed us, with uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, Nigerians are dying every day. Uh, our security agents are dying every day. It's so painful, Mary Ann, because uh, sometimes I, I, I'm just speechless, you know, because I see no reason. The, president's, the president himself is an ex-military general. How will, I just want to imagine, how will an ex-military general be going through uh, this kind of mess? It's an embarrassment to his uh, Well, but you said ex, and the president is no longer a military general. He does have generals. He should have the Should that be his job? I mean, that's why the president has aides and has these... Defense Chief of Defense Staff, he okay. has the Minister of Defense and all okay. of these people, the okay. DSS okay. and, and okay. Uh, the, I mean, so he has all of these people. Should I mean, yes, the box stops at, at Mr. President's table, but uh, can, can we say that these military generals, in your words, and these guys who are at the helm of affairs when it comes to our security have been able to do their jobs pretty well. Can we just blame Mr. President for people's incompetences? Well, you know, he's the leader. Like the last uh, service chief spent about five years in her office. And I was so amazed. Uh, would you allow these guys to spend five years in office? 
I think a lot of damages has been done before these guys left. And uh, in security, you don't give room for damages. When you give room for damages, then you spend a lot of time for damage control. Uh, presently, now we are going through damage control. Damage control in the areas of uh, terrorism, damage control in the areas of uh, banditry, damage control in the areas of um, kidnapping as well. Because uh, most of these guys have seen the vulnerability of our security agents. And they knew very well that, uh, they know very well that. Uh, the, the military and the security agent cannot contend with them uh, simply because uh, I think we are playing with those guys. You know, what is happening in Nigeria is a worse situation, Mary Ann. A worse situation is a situation whereby you need to declare full blown war against these guys. Uh, when you take over 999 of human lives from terrorism studies, it is a worse situation because mm. each life matters. Mm. But here, I think uh, Nigerian lives don't matter, just like those our uh, brothers and sisters in captivity for over 60 days or whatever the case may be. I saw some video moving around uh, the uh, media space, how they are being tortured in their own fatherland. I don't think it's a mistake to be a Nigerian. Uh, and also don't think it's a crime for you and I to be a Nigerian. Uh, we are in Nigeria. It's not our choice to be a Nigerian, but uh, we are in Nigerian by grace. Mm. So I think uh, we need to start holding our leaders accountable. If you cannot perform, just kindly resign and leave this office for people that can come in with strategy. <laughs> I'm sorry that I laughed. I'm wondering, has there been a precedence or any you know, uh, a leader that has stepped down in this country on whatever capacity. No accountability. Ex well, I'm, I mean, so I think that this is just a mere statement. But let's go to the core of insecurity in Nigeria. What do you think is at the core? And what do you think it's continuously fueling it? Um, certain people, would, certain analysts would say, well, because we're paying these kidnappers, we're funding it. Um, some other people will say that um, violence, electoral violence is also at the core of it. Um, but I want to know, is poverty also at the core of it? Is bad governance at the core of it? Let's well, analyze if, it. If you want to go into uh, causative factors of insecurity in Nigeria, they are multidimensional, and you, which you've mentioned. Uh, you know, here in Nigeria, we're suffering a lot of um, police brutality, educational brutality. Our students have been after school for over six months, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. That's educational brutality, tribal brutality, you know, uh, uh, religious brutality. You can see what's happening here in Nigeria. We've not even gotten into 2023 election. There's a lot of uh, fights here and there because of the Muslim Muslim ticket taking out a particular sect of the religion. Uh, that is going to be another big issue. We are supposed to <laughs> an impending big issues. Mm. Then also we're talking about poverty, which you're actually, which you, you actually right. You see, uh, like the Almajiris, uh, when you go to the north side of the uh, of, of this country, you find a lot of Almajiris. I was born and bred in the north. I was born in Medjugorje. I grew up in Sokoto State and Zaria. So I understand the lifestyle there. You know, Almajirism has been my, my uh, has been mismanaged here in Nigeria. You know, when you go into the tradition or the history of Almajiri, you know, there are people that goes into religious uh, learning, you know, just to go and learn more about religion and get it knowledge and, you know, excel in their lives. But here, we misplace Almajiri, we mismanage our Almajiri, we see them on the streets begging for bread and butter, begging for massa, begging for, for food and uh, drink, and uh, the, our leaders are robbing them of their future. Mm -hmm. uh, each time you rob them of their future, you are creating risk in this country because a jobless person on the street or or a child on the street is a potential threat to the government tomorrow. When I say potential threat, I mean it's going to be a threat to the government tomorrow. Take for instance now, you have about 5, 10 Almajiris on the street that don't have jobs. They always depend on the elites, the big men in quotes. They will go there and they will start singing in their dorm out and be praying for the, uh, praying for the big man. They will come and share them one, one thousand and say, ah, young kadede, young kadede, young kadede, ala badesa, ala badesa, you understand? They are telling him that God should give him more to give more. So those guys, when these terrorists uh, approach them, that is a uh, terrorism employment this time around. When these terrorists approach these guys, they tend to fall uh, mm -hmm. to these terrorist guys and they pick up arms against them. They say, hey, in the past 50 years, the government does not care about me. The past 10 years, the government does not care about me. I'm always on the street. So let me pick up this arm as an opportunity for me to strike against the state. And most of these guys that are going into terrorism and banditry, they are making, they are cashing out a lot of money. Just imagine the amount of money that has been cashed out uh, by these guys that uh, kidnap our people in the Kaduna Expressway. We are talking about hundreds of millions of Nera in the Nigerian territorial space. So most of this issue needs to be uh, addressed by our government. And military might will never eliminate terrorism or banditry. We need to start looking at the problem holistically. Educational-wise, we need to check about it because counter-terrorism comes with about five components. The first component is political components. Political-wise, you need to bring in state actors. Let us resolve the issue. What's the problem? Just like this Muslim-Muslim But ticket. in the case of these so-called bandits who are faceless, 
who are the, the, the actors, but how who do you get to? Who do you talk to? Because no, you don't, because you, don't. you see, security agencies will keep telling you that they don't know these people. We don't know where they are. So where, how do you bring them to the table? How do you do that? You can't bring them to the table. Bargaining with the devil is a sign of weakness. Why would you want to bargain with somebody who eliminates Nigerian lives? But you talked about state actors and non-state yes, actors. Yes, yes. When I talk about state actors, I'm talking about people in the affairs of government. Mm -hmm. For example, if I'm in a political party and I have grievances, or for example, for example, maybe you rob me of my mandates, I want to make your, your state governable. We haven't seen most of those things happening So you're in saying Nigeria. that politicians in this country oh, have sure. a hand in the oh, loss of, of lives of course. every oh, single Of day. course, I can categorically tell you that. And that is the truth because you cannot tell me that uh, most of this thing happening, we have no resolution to it. These people are from, from, from territories, they're from villages, they're from homes. Okay, if you want me to clarify that, I will confirm my facts to you about the turbaning of this guy in Zamfara State. Why is it being turbaned? On what ground? Is it because they've succumbed to its attack or its ill activities? We have a lot of issues to handle here in this country. But the truth is that I think some people are out there to hijack the Nigerian state and uh, trying to maybe uh, create unrest in Nigeria. 2023 is coming. It's around the corner. There's going to be a lot of unrest. We need to be prepared. It's not about <laughs> God forbid, but we must be prepared for the uh, I, I hate to sound like a pessimist or someone who's an unbeliever, but when you say that the elections are here and we need to be prepared, we still have our plate full and it doesn't seem like anybody is trying to unpack that. And then we have, like you have said, 2023 is around the corner. If we're un unable to deal with 2022, who's to say that we can deal with 2023 and what it has to offer? That's the problem here. So what we need to start doing presently, I saw it later going around the, the, the media space that the president says is going to deal with this guy before 2023 runs out. I, I, I laughed, you know, security is not magic. Security is process. Uh, the hierarchy of protection is very clear. The hierarchy of control is very clear. Um, the topmost priority of any governance is the protection of human lives. Uh, you measure your success by the, by the protection of human lives. So you can't tell me Nigerians are dying every day and you tell me your administration is doing so well. Uh, because human lives are irreplaceable. Your phone is replaceable. Every other items are replaceable. So we need to start looking at the protection of Nigerian lives. Let's take place top priority on our lives. If we don't place priority on human lives, we can't succeed. Now, for me to tell you that we don't place priority on human lives, truly, those guys, 60 Nigerians that were kidnapped in the Cardinal train attacks, they've been in captivity for over 60 days. Mm. That is to tell you that this government or the Nigerian state does not place priority on human lives. An American was kidnapped some years ago, last year or two years ago, I think in, the, last year. In, in the Niger, Nigerian borders around the area. They flew in commandos, you know, great guys that came in, busted the terrorist camp and re, uh, retrieved the American. That tells you how the American people place priority on their citizens. If you don't place priority on your citizens, you suffer setback. And that's where social contract comes to play. Social contract, give me protection, give me amenities, give me infrastructure, give me good education. Nigerians now, most of our people are out of school. And a lot of them will definitely venture into crime because yeah. they need to get out of school, get something to do, and have a living. But at the time, you are just sitting at home jobless, it's going to be sad, and it's a sad one. Mm. Let's talk about us, the people. Before we go back to Mr. President, we're going to dissect Mr. President a bit. Uh, you talk about the social contract. The contract is between two people. And if our social contract has been one way or the other violated on one hand, are we also not playing a role in this violation, I ask, because there are people who, would, who are in support of what is happening in the country, or in support of certain politicians who you know are part of the problem. And there are also people who are on the other side saying, we want some form of responsibility. But how do we, are we, as Nigerians, do you think we hold our leaders accountable enough? Because if Mr. President ran telling us that he wants to fight insecurity, he was going to put it to bed, he was going to bring employment to young people, he's not done that. Uh, he was going to f share, fight um, corruption. Share money mm -hmm. around 5,000 there, I think. I was even expecting my 5K. I've not gotten my 5K since 2015. What is our role as, as Nigerians? Because it's not enough for us to say we're jettisoning that responsibility to the president because he is the one that we've asked to lead us. But what about us as followers? What should we be doing that we're not doing? Well, I, I think you make a fantastic point. We are centralizing our problem. 
uh, that is not supposed to be true. Uh, that's not supposed to be it. Uh, but the truth is that they say that in any given home, if anything goes wrong, you hold the head you know, of, the, of that home. So definitely we're going to hold him because he is the leader of the affairs of this great nation. Uh, basically, what we need in this country, we all need societal attitude and change individually. You know, for example, there was a paper that went, I was interviewed in Punch newspaper some few days ago about some police people that arrested some Nigerians and uh, take money from them, you know, about, I think, 50,000 or something like that. And uh, I, I realized that both the giver and the receiver are both liable. So here in Nigeria, we need to start looking at uh, accountability plane from the horizontal and the vertical plane uh, in the sense that those who leave office must be made to come and give an account how they... Who's going to uh, make them give an account if their they friends do, and we, their we, cronies we, we, are the we, ones we, who take we, over we from create, them? We need to create an institution that will be in charge of that because you can't just come... We have so many institutions. How responsible are those institutions? Then that is to tell you that well, the, the government... the people who are running those That is to tell you that the major problem we're having is leadership. Leadership-wise. We've seen countries like Rwanda that has been into genocide, into great war, one of the toughest war in the history of mankind. So vulnerable. You, uh, Rwanda is one of the most beautiful countries today. Why? Leadership-wise. Because the leader, if a leader stands on his ground and says, hey, this has to be this, this has to be this, the citizens don't have an option because that is where you need to integrate the administration of criminal justice system with leadership-wise. If the government had taken uh, supremacy in leadership, because when you look at the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, most times the executive are taking supremacy over the legislature and the uh, judiciary, which is not supposed to be. Everybody has a role to play. So the judiciary needs to be independent of its own statutory institution in the sense that if anything comes uh, to, the, to the judicial line, I think we need to start addressing crimes and punishment with speed and momentum. And one of the reasons why crime has flourished here in Nigeria is because we have not been addressing it with speed and momentum. Take an example, Evans was arrested some years ago. It takes almost five or six years to award him some uh, punishment or award, him ju award judgment. Why does it have to take five years? for the judiciary to run a matter. We need to start looking at the judicial speed. You need to apply speed and momentum. Most times people say justice delay is justice denied. For me, I think our justice delayed is a defeat on our judicial system. It makes the judicial system vulnerable. Is it, if we need to, you know, create more uh, law courts, let's create. If we need to, you know, create more, uh, 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 you know, uh, start, uh, promote more judges, let's promote more judges. We need to add speed to the administration of criminal justice system. Most of these criminal guys that come to Nigeria to commit crime, and I tell you that they've perceived Nigeria as a vulnerable state. Uh, just like last few years, you know, some people went to the House of Assembly and cut away our maze. Uh, I was so surprised that if hoodlums can go into the National Assembly to cut away our maze of the mm. Federal Republic of Nigeria, mm. that tells you that the Nigerian state is vulnerable. And that is why most of these guys just believe that they can come to Nigeria and commit crime and go scot free. And they are really succeeding in their And talking about that, it takes me back to 2016, if I'm not mistaken, the Sultan of Sakoto, Allah Hadjis Abubakar at some point said when we started having this you know issue of banditry uh, had said that had alleged that the people who were committing these crimes were not nigerians and the question i kept asking was how bad is it for us that we would let non-nigerians come into nigeria and kill nigerians and and go scot free and we still throw our hands up in the air when we have leadership um there's also that that um you know story of oh this our soldiers are thinly stretched the police is incapacitated. And so what do we do? The gov Governor Zulum at some point said, hey, everybody get a gun. And not only Zulum, even the Zamfara State Governor and Kassina and Governor says uh, everybody should start picking a gun. Nigeria is not right for us to start picking a gun. If you pick a gun uh, today, I, I, can, I can tell you tens of people will start blowing up their head uh, because even the stress in Nigeria is enough for some people to take their lives. God forbid that should not be the case. Uh, for me, uh, if you're talking about the external external factors, that's where our military comes to play because the military is solely responsible for external aggression. Nigeria is suffering from external aggression. Most of these guys, I can tell you, they are non-Nigerians as well. And that is why, you know, just like the way you treat your brothers, you can't treat your brother the way you treat outsiders. You treat your brothers with care. So most of these guys, they, they knew they are not Nigerians. And that's why they come with this animal behavior and devilish character to come and start capturing Nigerians on our highway, taking them to a government space, 
getting money from them. And that is where we need to start looking at identification process. Uh, we need to start looking at immigration as well. Nigerian immigration needs to be straightened. Uh, there is an agency in the immigration service known as the Border Management Agency that are solely responsible for the protection of our national borders. I have advised many times that the federal government should start looking at you know, empowering the Nigerian immigration. The strength of the Nigerian immigration is not up to 35,000 personnel uh, mm -hmm. for a country of over 200 million. And we have about 1,400 uh, irregular routes which these guys, irregular migrants, are taking. Absolutely. I wouldn't want to use the word illegal because no human being is illegal. Yes, mi migration yeah. is migration. It's just yeah. unusual. It's very unusual. Yeah. yeah, you're very correct. So we need to start looking at our border security because we have the, the process of our national border is also contributing. So a lot of factors are contributing to the space of insecurity in Nigeria because a borderless nation is a no nation. If you have a porous border, just for example now in this beautiful edifice, if you want to, uh, you know, you know, spray insecticide in these premises, what do you do first? You close your windows. If you open your windows, you are doing a bad job. So the windows here is talking about our national borders. Mm. If we want to have an effective security measures in our country, we need to shut down our national borders, go into your government space, take over your government space. First of all, we need to carry out an assessment. Where are the vulnerable holes in our national borders? Where and where are these guys taking through? Then project immigration I'm sorry, do we have to, because I can name some, a few from off the top of my head. There's so many in my state that way you can just literally cross over to another country. Uh, we know these things, but mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to understand why we sound as if these things have to be, we have to blindly try to look, search for these things. Is it that we do not know the problem or we're not willing to deal with it? There's no political way. We don't have political way. If we have political way in Nigeria, I tell you, Mary Ann, we'll be able to take out all these issues. Security is achievable. And I tell you the truth, security is achievable. Ah, the only way you can succeed in security management in Nigeria is only when the security agents take a departure from politics. Ah, talking about that. Let's yes. get into the politicking of uh, <laughs> or how over-politicized our security agencies have become. Oh, yeah. I remember last year, if I'm not mistaken, the chief of defense staff had told us that we were cowards and that we should be able to pick up arms and fight these bandits. I cannot forget uh, when he said that. And I'm wondering, this is a guy that is being paid to be in charge of defense, and this is what he tells us. And this is also a general. Like you said, we have so many generals. Again, should we be allowing politics into the security space? And what needs to be done to depoliticize, if there's a word like that? The, you know, the security yeah, one of the problems I've identified uh, in uh, the security relationship with politicians is that it's because of greed. Uh, you know, the, the, the national anthem has, has said it all. The national pledge has said it all. Uh, you know, most times, most people just think the national anthem is a, it's just a normal day-to-day -day music. It's, it's an oath. The national pledge is an oath. Until our security agent begins to see the national anthem and the national pledge as an oath, they will not do things right. Until they file a divorce between them and the politicians, they will not get things right. Because I see no reason why we have hundreds of hundreds of generals, we have hundreds of police officers, thousands, I mean to say, of police officers, thousands of military, and billions and trillions are being spent. Then some people on Okada are just taking over territories. Spent where? Because you, you see, know? there's a question of where's, where's the money? Trillions. I heard early this year that trillions of Naira, even dollars, have been voted to security in this country. Uh, let's not even go into the issue of security votes, which is shrouded in so much secrecy. Okay. Where does that money go? Because I remember also sometime, I think four years ago, in a never ever seen video, soldiers complaining about the equipments that they're using to fight these so-called terrorists and the fact that those people are better armed than them. Uh, and, and that was, you know, again, swept under the carpet. So <laughs> I ask, where, where does the money go? And who's, who's giving account? Because there's also been cases where the National Assembly has summoned these security chiefs and they don't show up. That is what I'm talking about, accountability. If we don't have an effective accountability uh, processes here in Nigeria, people will not, uh, people will not be held accountable. Uh, you know, we're talking about the billions and millions our government has spent. We've seen a lot of videos going around the media space. Our soldiers are crying. Mary Ann, I can tell you categorically that we have a, a, a formidable military. Hmm. But I don't know what the problem is because um, as a former soldier, I, I know the capability of the Nigerian army. I know the capability of the Nigerian army. I know the capability of the Nigerian military. 
What is going on wrong? Because the battle begins from the mind. Mm. I have identified so many vulnerable areas of the Nigerian military. First of all, their operational strategy is highly, highly, highly porous. Then their tactical strategy as well. Uh, because most times I've seen our soldiers being on the defensive line. You don't be on the defensive line in a war situation in your own territory. You go before the enemy, mm. overtake the enemy, and take that territory. That is to say, you take back the territory, you hold that territory, and you re rebuild. This has always been this has been done always by the military, and the military should start looking at policing duty as well, mm. uh, taking a departure from policing duty because some of the police duty are being done by the military, yes. by the military themselves. So yes. for me, if we don't hold people accountable, our soldiers will keep on dying in the battlefield. We've seen generals crying on the battlefield that mm. there's no arms and ammunition. So what is the problem? That tells you that there is a fifth columnist that are sabotaging the effort of this great nation. Mm. The conversation that has to be had more and more, and especially as we're getting ready for the elections, we need to be clear on our demands, I'm guessing. Oh, sure. We need to be very, very clear on our demand. Our demand is to take back Nigeria, um, to bring back Nigeria. You know, Nigeria needs to come back to its glorious days. Okay. Uh, because uh, I d d just imagine uh, the president, the chief of army staff of Liberia some few days ago, uh, during their celebration, sent a message to Nigeria that the sacrifices of our soldiers made Liberia what Liberia is today. The and Nigerian army paid the supreme prize in Liberia. Bring Liberia to a standstill. Went to Sierra Leone, brought Liberia to a standstill. Take out all the enemies. They're coming back to Nigeria. They are killing them like chicken. They are killing them like cows. It's unfortunate. Then that means that the Nigerian soldier's life does not matter. If we don't put in strategy in place to ensure that we take out these criminal elements, Nigeria will be overrun by these guys. Well, well, let's hope that that doesn't happen. Um, um, Asaje is a criminologist and a global security analyst. I want to say thank you so much uh, for being part of this conversation. Thank you for having me. All right, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking with Sarah as they're asking the federal government, uh, well, to deal with the issue of vote buying in the past election in Ekiti State. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs>